Hey everybody, it's Contario. I'm back again with Christ in Comics. Hey, uh, today, you know, I you know it's been about a week since I did my video. I wanted to do one Wednesday. I wanted to do it on this content, uh, but it had a lot going on to keep me busy. But anyway, you know, I'm going to go ahead and do this video anyway. I'm looking to really kind of get more to uh, my personal interest, speak about my personal, you know, uh, hobbies, I guess you could say. Um, and if you watch the This Is Me video, you kind of see more so of what I'm actually about to be talking about and why. Um, one, that video speaks on where my passions lie. Two, that video speaks on uh, really also what I'm wanting to really dig, dig more deep into as we go more into Christ and comics. Because, of course, American comics was a starting place, but uh, Japanese comics, otherwise known as manga, is where my heart really delves deep. And that's also where I started to really see Christ making himself evident in that content. And so I wanted to kind of introduce everybody to some of the series that I actually collect. And I collect quite a few of them. Uh, so if you'll bear with me as we go through these, and I'll, you know, I'll talk about it just a little. I'm not going to talk about the whole series, but just to introduce you and, you know, let you know where that, that interest comes from. Uh, and maybe even where it rela uh, relates spiritually. So, you know, the first book I want to get into, it's my favorite of all time, One Piece. One Piece here, if you can see it, I, this is volume one. But I actually have collected all the way up to 90. Um, I believe they're out with 91, but I haven't got that volume yet. So I have all 90 books uh, currently of One Piece. Uh, one Piece is my number one, one of my number one favorites of all time. Um, and of course, you know, it's probably like, well, what about Dragon Ball Z? Of course, of course, obviously. I watched Dragon Ball Z as a kid in the anime. I watched One Piece's anime. I watched Roni Kenshin. I watched all of those great series of the past, Yu Yu Hakusho. I watched them all, even watched Sailor Moon. But One Piece was one that when it was coming out and it was getting popular, it was like, this is the underdog series. That's how I saw One Piece as the underdog series. So when it came to One Piece, I, I got so hooked on it because of that. You know, you didn't think Luffy could do much. You didn't think the main character could really have an impact and be strong enough to contend with other series. Not only as far as the comic book series itself, but the main character couldn't contend with like maybe Naruto or, or Goku or Ichigo from Bleach. You know, but he's shown himself to be stronger than several different types of opponents where he otherwise should have lost. So that's why I really respect the series. I love an underdog story. Um... And that's one of the things that really caught me. The other thing that caught me primarily... So, you know Mr. Fantastic from the Fantastic Four, right? He is a very stretchy character. Plastic Man from DC, not to delve too deep into him, but he's another stretchy type of character in the comic book realm. From my understanding, when I was younger around that time, both of those characters truly, truly were lame. I thought they were really, really lame. Mr. Fantastic isn't cool for his stretching. He's really, really cool for his intellect. He's a highly, highly intellectual character. Um, he's one of the rivaling um, knowledgeable characters on par with Tony Stark. He's actually believed to be smarter than Tony Stark. Um, now, Plastic Man, he's different. Plastic Man, I actually learned he, there's more to him than that. Like, he can actually probably beat Superman if he wanted to because he can uh, manipulate his man molecular structure along with several other abilities. So, to come to find out, he's actually strong, too, as a stretchy character. But anyway, to dial it back. Stretchy characters didn't really have a cool ability that really got people going. But when it came to One Piece, seeing Luffy being able to stretch and throw punches and stretch and throw kicks, headbutts with stretching, he made all of that look awesome. If any of you guys know about his his, his um, gum gum mm -hmm. rifle, that's when he twists his arm, spirals it up. So it is tight, real tight. And then when he throws it, it spins out. Boom, knocks you in the face and you got two spinning out. So, like, that's one of the best moves he's ever done. Um, but not to stick in it to it too much longer. But what's really, you can actually see a spiritual aspect with that, uh, with One Piece and a kind of, you know, Moses-like storyline. Somewhat. I won't say entirely. I'll just say somewhat. Because the book of Exodus, which introduces the story of Moses and him delivering the children of Israel, is truly an adventure to deliver a people and to make them a great nation. Now, it's not, the story itself isn't about Luffy wanting to become a great nation. It's about him wanting to become the king of the pirates, being the top pirate. Now, he's, the storyline, of course, is going from a positive aspect. He ends up in towns where he otherwise is just freeloading and chilling and, and eating whatever he wants with and trying to get away with it. But he actually ends up delivering several people from their bondage. So he goes from place to place, literally delivering people from bondage. And in some essence, that's a very Moses-esque character to see him doing those types of things and so i really really love that about the story and even more so the story really kills it beats everybody out i don't care 
what series you've watched, I don't care what series you've read, One Piece beats everybody out for backstory. Backstory is its best content. You love it. Every time you hear about Zoro's backstory, you hear about even Usopp. People get sad about Usopp's backstory, and his was kind of sad, kind of lame. Um, I'll go deeper into those types of things because I actually want to kind of do a series on One Piece one day, um, but that's not going to be the time for now. But every character has their own backstory. Even when they introduce villains, they got a backstory, and you're just like, man, not, see, now I'm not even mad at the person who's bad. I'm not that mad at him anymore. So it kind of does a back and forth between using those backstories to really introduce the depth of a character. And so that, that's some of the things to point out about One Piece and what really catches my attention with it. Another series that I collect, and this is a more of a new generation series, but I want to introduce it simply because it's one of the most popular and very well written of this time that has such a very good storyline. And that is A Silent Voice. A Silent Voice it's about a little deaf girl who ends up going to the school. And as she goes to this school, um, she's considered weird. This is about, like, I guess you could say elementary school, maybe fourth or fifth grade, right around that time. But um, anyway, so she's coming to the school, trying to be a part of the people, trying to be like everybody else. But she needs, you know, I guess you could say special treatment. And so with that being the case, she's already always weirded out her fellow classmates, one of which the main character was weirded out by her. Um, and because everyone else was pushing towards i guess you could say bullying to put it simply the main character pushed into doing the same thing he thought everyone else was doing it but he went too far and in him going too far people started to bully him instead so he hadn't realized how far he had pushed it and had hurt this young girl to where she even ended up switching schools and that impacted his life as well not to delve too deep into the story, but you do realize early on that it leads to him having suicidal thoughts and even stepping close to making that actual decision of taking his own life. But the story begins to change to really emphasize the impact of being a deaf girl, the impact of being that person that's an outsider because you view others as being outside of yourself. That real, that real impact of isolation and feeling alone, it really hits on all of those contents. That is what you would call a school life story, um, it, which is really really actually some of my favorites and in some essence is actually a very uh it's a harem there it, that a harem is where the main character who is a guy has several girls that have an interest in him but there's only one girl that will actually end up with him now again like i said it's only slightly a harem because one there's not several girls trying to fawn at this one guy two the story doesn't end with him actually making a decision the story ends with it being implied that he's made a decision so I kind of like that as well because it allows for your imagination to kind of fill in the blanks and even more so to hope for more to the story later on. It'll do like a continuation, I guess you could say, a time skip as some people use. Um, but that is one of the other series that I collect. I have all books of that. It's only, a, I believe, a seven book series. So that one's actually already done. Um, another one to introduce. I only got three more I want to bring forth. But this one is really, 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 really really and i'm not tripping guys really good this is called platinum end platinum end is an incredibly well-written series this is volume three by the way but i'm only showing volume three because one of my other buddies he's reading volume one and two so you know this series is incredible it's extremely incredible it's written by takeshi obata and sagumi oba incredible writers right up there with um so, so, Takeshi Obata and Sugumi Oba. Sugumi Oba is the writer of the series. Uh, Takeshi Obata is the artist. Both are very popular for what they're capable of, and they come together to create very popular stories. Um, and you may know those are those writers and illustrators from the creator of Death Note to really push the bar there to tell you how good of the story it actually is. Those two can make an epic story. So if you love Death Note, you'll love Platinum End. It really kind of sticks in that area of Death Note. So the writing, the storyline, the talking, the trickery, all of that that's in there is very well thought out. So the thing about those two being able to create this particular series, this series is talking about, uh, and I'm just going to say it as it is, is pointing out that God is about to die. So with God being about to die, God is looking to select his replacement. So he sends out his angels, I believe he sends out 12 of his angels, to go and select those that they think will be prime God candidates. Some of the angels equip them with wings. Some of the angels can equip them with wings and arrows. Now, the thing about the arrows is you can have one arrow that's red and the red arrows will pierce the heart of the person for 30 days and it makes them fall in love with them um, to the point of they'll do anything that they tell them, even kill themselves. They'll be that obedient to them because they love them so much. 
Um, the other arrow is the white arrow, which is an instant kill arrow. So you can have one or the other or all three. Um, the main character, he actually was given all three. He truly refuses to use the white arrows because he made the mistake of using the red arrow and telling his um, aunt, who there's more backstory to that. If you love to read it, I highly recommend it. I don't want to remove. I don't want to reveal too much. But the mother, the um, aunt, ends up killing herself by order of the main character, and that, in a sense, traumatized him because he didn't want to be as dark and as corrupt as the aunt and as his uncle. Um, he didn't want to be like them. He more so wanted to be like his parents who have already died, who instilled in him to maintain love in his heart and to live by love. Now, one thing that's also interesting, anyone who is selected to be a God candidate happens to always be someone that's on the brink of taking their own life. So there's a lot of deep and deep, deep things involved in that to speak to the main, to speak to this whole entire story. And of course, you can tell the main character, he's all about demonstrating love and not having to kill people to fulfill what needs to be done. He doesn't ever want to have to use a white arrow, to put it simply. Um, that part can get a bit, a bit tricky and a bit mixed up. But they, again, they did a great job of writing this story, being that you have, of course, people who are given the right, the choice to be God and doing evil things with it. But like I said, everyone is on the brink of taking their own life um, due to what's going on in their personal life with the Chosen as God candidates. But I highly recommend that series. I, I really, really do. You love Death Note, you'll love Platinum End. Please, I recommend you go pick it up. Uh, this other series, now it's kind of to change the game a little bit. Um, and also the reason I'm introducing this is to also introduce that I am a Christian, yes, and that is my primary focus, that's my primary lifestyle. On top of that, that doesn't take away, you know, where the interests lie as far as illustration, as far as writing. Even when it comes to, you know, Christian illustrations, I do desire that they be a bit more real than they have been. So that's why I wanted to bring up here, this is called Magical Girl Apocalypse. Now, this is a very, very lengthy story, and the reason I, the only reason I say that, and I'm going to get into it, is... So, Magical Girl Apocalypse is about, the, you know, the main character who is looking to make the decision to finally, you know, ask out the girl that he's been in love with. And then, all of a sudden, these little doll-like beings start falling from the sky, going around and just massacring people. Completely massacring people. Like, the first scene you see is the main character's gym teacher meeting one of those dolls at the gate of the school and she's swinging like this little mace type thing that explodes and blowing off his head. So, and it goes from there to them destroying and wreaking havoc across the school. So that storyline is very great for an uh, apocalyptic story, which a lot of people who like anime, who like manga, that's why people like Attack on Titan, it's a post-apocalyptic story, and they're wanting to see, oh my gosh, how, are hum how is humanity going to survive all of this? So that's what's happening here is everyone's getting destroyed by these magical beings that, I will tell you now, are not easy to kill. You can't do it. You literally can't. There's one doll that can possess a person's body and enhance their physical strength to exponential peaks. Like when I say exponential, like punch you, your head comes off. She possessed like a, a nine-year-old little girl, punch somebody, head came off. Like it's ridiculous. And if you try to kill the thing, the thing can just jump from body to body and keep going. So it's a very, very dangerous, uh, very, very dangerous doll. And there's several others. There's like giant ones. There's one that can manipulate time. So, and there's one that can like freeze you. Like it's crazy how deep this story goes. So there's a lot of blood and gore. There are very etchy scenes, a slightly revealing. I'm not going to lie to you that it, the content is there, but it keeps it real as to far as some of the things that could happen in a very chaotic situation. Uh, so one thing that's good about this story that I find interesting is the story doesn't stick with let's just keep up with the blood and gore people dying blah 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 they don't stick in that realm they get deep into going ahead and saying hey there's a reason all of this happens so as I was starting to actually lose interest in the series the series promoted and it said hey this is what really led to this and it made it to where there's actual like piece by piece that makes sense okay Wow, that's very interesting. Now, you might say, well, what does that have to do with a Christian? Well, the thing about that is, what is a Christian going to do in a very chaotic situation? How are you going to carry yourself? Now, TV shows and other movies and things like that illustrate us as being ones that are trying to maintain a level head, and then we end up being the coward in the story. Or we're trying to say, well, God is with you no matter what happens. And then the next moment, you see us betraying the person that toes to ride or die with us anyway and that I feel like that's kind of a hurtful portrayal of us and I think that if 
we are honest with ourselves about how we would handle a very chaotic situation, then people will be able to see even a child of God in a different light. Because even though we may be Christians, we will do what we have to do to protect our home. We may be Christians. On, on top of that, we will make sure that no one will come against us or even more so come against our faith. For we will stand for what it is that we believe. So even for a story like that, where you're put in a situation where it's a life or death situation, even we as Christians do have to make some of the hard decisions and the rash decisions. It's not as though we're going to be the wisest people in a bunch in the midst of chaos or an apocalyptic situation, but that does mean that we're going to have to face something like that, whether it be now or if someone is still here at rapture time, not to dig into revelations, but if someone is here during rapture times and needs to be a child of God, there is going to be someone that's going to be there. There's going to be someone that's going to have to carry himself. So we can't act as though we're separate from those chaotic things. If anything, as ones that have to go to war in a spiritual sense, we need to be more prepared for that than anybody else. So we can't act as though that, oh, that's nasty. Stay away from No, you need to know what's happening. You need to be mindful of where what is bringing these things about so that we can know how to war against it properly. The last series I want to introduce is a very mid new popular series. I, and the reason I say mid new, because it's like you have, you know, your Dragon Ball Z era, then you have your Naruto era, and like immediate, immediately following, you have this. This is called Bakuman. Bakuman is called, otherwise means gamble manga. So Baku meaning gamble, man meaning manga. So this means gamble manga. The reason I'm bringing this in, this is the last book I'm introducing, and here is why. Because Bakuman, same creators of Death Note. If you can't see that tag, that button right there, it says, from the creators of Death Note. I highly, 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 highly recommend it. A lot of people watching this right now, primarily, you probably love anime more than you do the manga. Uh, you probably love watching anime more than you like to read manga. Um, if you were trying to watch this, you won't like watching that, but you will love reading it. For my manga friends and family that I know, you love reading it. I know a lot of you have read it and found this series to be amazing. This is a tier one. Tier one. Not tier two. Not, oh, it's real close to death. No, I'm saying tier one series. And this is why. Bakuman, meaning gamble manga, is introducing what it means to be a manga artist. What it means to create manga. What they go through to actually create manga. The main character, what happened with him was... He wasn't willing to step into that realm because he lost his uncle who was into doing manga for a living. But the main character had learned what the sacrifices that his uncle made to actually become a great manga artist. But his uncle never succeeded. The thing is, he wanted to, but he hid from it because of the lack of success, because of the big sacrifice it would take to really reach that goal. But he was willing to make that sacrifice Granted, it was for a girl. He proposed to a girl by wanting to do manga. If he created the greatest manga of all time, then she would end up marrying him. So that was the deal from the get-go. You got to read it. It's incredible. But what it does is it's not simply about watching people talk about stories and write stories and, and all of that. It's not just a big old documentary story. It's a great storyline in and of itself. But you really see what the people who make these series all the time go through, what they wrestle with, entering into competitions and getting accepted or rejected. You see them debating on whether or not this will or will not work. You hear them putting out crappy things and preparing to bring out even bigger and better things. You watch that struggle. You watch two people have to compete against one person who is better than them by himself, but these two have to go and work together. It really kind of gives you a perspective on Sugumi Oba and Takeshi Ubata, to be honest, honest. But that's what's so viable and so vibrant about this series is you look at that and you say, man, they really go through a lot to give us these series. And even more so, just to, as a golden nugget, a manga writer, what they do is they write the series, they try to make it popular, and when it really gets popular, a producer comes and says, hey, I would like to make your series into an anime. So once they do so, I'm really simplifying all these details because I want you to go get this series, okay? I really do. So they come to the manga writer and their editor and say, hey, we want to make this into an anime. Are you okay with that? Do you want to sign this contract? Do you want to allow us to make this? The writer says yes. Writers saying yes, primarily, regularly, is them writing away the rights to it, in a sense. And what I mean by that is, the anime producers will make the show and try and stick it to the story. But you know how we have those fillers? A lot of them, majority of them, aren't produced by the writer. 
They're produced by the producers. That's why a lot of them conflict with the actual story storyline, stem away from it, um, hinder them. So there's a lot of um, there's a lot of impact that comes from going from manga to anime, um, which I personally think it kind of, in one sense hurts it, in another sense it helps it. Uh, it all depends on what they do. Um, and another aspect to that, if you're famous, for instance, like um, like Takeshi Obata, if you're popular like uh, Ichiro Oda, uh, Taik Kubo, uh, Masashi Kishimoto. Um, I can't believe I can't think of his name right now. The creator of Dragon Ball Z, uh, Lord Jesus, what is that man's name? Anyway, that guy, that guy right there, creator of Dragon Ball Z. He is, um, Ken Kosemura, I think his name is, the creator of Negima. So all of these people are so good at writing their stories that the producers go to them for how they should write a filler. So... It all depends if you become that popular, whether or not you actually have a say-so. So if you're not that popular of, of, a, of a writer, then you won't really get uh, brought in to say, hey, what do you think we should do at this point? You know, they won't come to you for your opinion. Even when it comes to movies, they won't come to you for your opinion. They'll just put out their own stuff. So that's where it's a really big game to do manga. Because someone can really ruin your series by doing so. And they did that with Bleach, not to delve deep into that. But that's all I have for you guys today. These are the series that I collect, and I collect several different more. I like to kind of span out. Um, one of the things, last thing I want to leave you with, my friends, when we wrote manga, when we um, got into collecting manga, one of the agreements that we made was if someone claimed a series or was um, collecting one, you didn't collect it. Because at that point, you could just borrow it from the friend. So when we were... When we were all split up, like one guy had One Piece, the other dude had Naruto, and the other guy had Bleach. So it was up to them to keep collecting it so they could read it, but then also so everyone else could read it. So that's why my collection's so huge and so spanned out is because I was trying to make claim of several different series. And at the same time, there's a lot of series I haven't really caught up on. So it's, it's really kind of funny. But at the same time, I make sure to collect the ones that I really cherish personally. Um, I even have My Hero Academia for any of you that might be wondering. Like, I wonder if he has their good ones. Yes, I have My Hero Academia. Um, I am even collecting Dr. Stone. I'm only on Volume 3, but I, I do want to catch up more of that series because that series is really good. Um, as I said, I'm collecting One Piece and my collection keeps growing and growing and growing. So anyone that really likes the Japanese creative writing and artistry, I really recommend that you get into reading the books as well as watching the anime. Use your imagination to picture these things. Really see what you can see in your own head as you're reading. You know, how you would see that fight scene playing out. And then go watch the anime. Because it really brings it to life what you were hoping you were going to see getting into a series. Uh, but thank you guys for watching. This is Christ in Comic Books. Thank you again as I introduce you guys to some of my books. Um, I also want to prepare you that I'm going to be getting Death Note. Like I said, one of my buddies, he already started collecting it uh, years ago. So I'm going to be getting the books from him. Um, I'm going to get those. I'm going to read a couple of the volumes. And we're going to talk about the spiritual relation between what is already being brought forth in Death Note and how that correlates, one, with us as people, two, um, with the Word of God, and how Christ plays a huge part in the storyline of Death Note. Thank you, guys, and y'all have a blessed evening.